my name's Hannah, and, and I'm a lecturer in, in science communication. And that's all about teaching scientists um, and science communication students how to communicate um, about science and technology um, and the related concepts um, to put different publics who, who might know less about those things. Um, but my background's actually uh, in linguistics um, and studying language. And my PhD was actually about um, evolutionary linguistics and thinking about how um, our human ancestors uh, went from a, a stage when they didn't have language um, to a stage uh, where they do have language, right? And those kind of subjects seem uh, not... People kind of struggle to see how they're related or how I kind of went from one to the other. But I think there's one key concept um, that really links them quite well, and that concept is the concept of, of shared knowledge. Um, so to explain shared knowledge, um, I usually like to use the example of Ted Danson. This is because one time I did a talk and somebody reviewed the talk and said there was way more Ted Danson in it than, than he was expecting there to be, and that's created uh, this expectation that... <laughs> Ted Danson has to be in every single talk I give. But Ted Danson, he's a, he's a friendly guy. He likes to talk to people. He likes to have a chat. Um, but it's easier for Ted Danson to talk to some people than to other people. And the easiest person for Ted Danson to have a conversation with uh, is himself because he speaks the same language as himself. Uh, he has exactly the same cultural background as himself and has exactly the same overlapping knowledge as himself. Um, so it's almost as if he doesn't even need to open his mouth to have that conversation, <laughs> right? He is himself. But if Ted Danson was to instead go on a little world tour, if he came to Newcastle, had a, a conversation with me, um, he'd probably be quite um, successful in communicating with me. We both share the same language, we both speak uh, English, but in order to have that conversation, he has to make all sorts of assumptions about what I know and what references I'll get. Um, we have a bit of a generational difference and also a little bit of a cultural difference. I live in the UK, he lives in America, right? So there might be some things, topics that he might avoid because he thinks I won't get it. And that's fine. But instead, it, then if he went to um, somewhere like Japan and went and spoke to one of the locals who doesn't necessarily speak English, um, he would have a much more difficult time having that conversation, right? Because he doesn't have a shared language. Um, so then he needs to start thinking about what his shared knowledge is in order to start trying to communicate with a specific person, right? And he might do that by using kind of... Uh, global uh, conventions that human have, humans have. He might start pointing to things or gesturing things that he knows that we have in common. Um, it's quite easy to kind of uh, gesture things like emotions because we know that all humans um, share emotions, so you can gesture laughing, you can gesture crying, and people will get that. Let's now imagine instead that Ted Danson goes on holiday to Mars and starts to try and have conversations uh, with aliens. All aliens come to Earth and start trying to have a conversation with Ted Danson. Right? This creates a much more difficult problem because not only did they not share um, a shared uh, cultural um, background or a shared knowledge, but they also don't have a shared language or even um, a shared notion of what language might be. And that's why aliens coming to Earth is a lot more kind of comparable when we, in terms of situation when we think about the, the, the problem that our ancestors had to overcome when they were kind of negotiating um, the first human um, language type communication systems, right? There was no existing notion of what language was or what it looked like, right? It's, it's very similar to, the, to the, the problem that they try and uh, solve in the film Arrival. Um, has anybody seen Arrival? Yeah, I have an arrival tattoo if anybody wants to see it in the interval. <laughs> um, <laughs> but so, for the benefit of, of the people in the room who haven't seen Arrival, um, and for the entertainment of those who have, I'm going to um, enact a small scene from the beginning of the film. Um, so, uh, the setup is that the aliens have landed on Earth. Um, that's in the trailer, so it's not a spoiler. Um, <laughs> and Amy Ad Adams uh, plays a linguistics professor, and she's sat in her office watching the news because aliens have landed, and who wouldn't be watching the news in that instance? And this helicopter lands outside, um, and it's Forrest Whitaker uh, who plays an army general. And he comes charging into the uh, uh, Amy Adams' office um, and, and has this tape recorder and puts this tape recorder down and says, um, I need uh, you to do a, a translation for me. 
presses the play button on the, the, the recorder, and there's this sound that comes out of this recorder, which is, it sounds a little bit like this. It goes, uh, and, and, and Amy Adams is like, oh my God, is that the aliens? And, and Forrest Whitaker's like, yeah, can you translate it? <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing, right? Because this is actually what happens in the film, and everybody's like, yeah, okay, but it is ridiculous. And Amy Adams is like, no, mate, I don't speak alien. Um, and, and Forrest Whitaker's like, uh, well, yeah, but can you hear any phrases? Can you hear any words? And she's like, no, <laughs> I don't speak alien. Um, like, you just, you've got a recording here, but I'm not aware of the context in which the aliens are making these noises. I'm not aware of the environment. Um, I'm not able to interact with them. You know, you're making a huge assumption here that it, the aliens are even communicating using uh, the medium of sound, right? Which is an enormous assumption. And Forrest Whitaker's like, oh, you were really good at translating the Farsi that I brought you before. And Amy Adams is like, I already spoke Farsi. <laughs> Uh, this is a really, really difficult problem. I need to be in front of the aliens, right, in order to do this. And for the rest of the film, like, she does that. She, she gets taken to the aliens, and um, that she has this um, very long negotiation to kind of work out a communication system that they can share. But I think that this really, really highlights how difficult this problem is. Um, uh, how difficult the problem of trying to communicate when you have very, very little in terms of shared knowledge and in terms of... Um, uh, a shared language. It's really, really difficult f when you're talking to aliens. It's really, really difficult um, when you're uh, our human ancestors trying to negotiate uh, a language. And it's also um, difficult for science communicators trying to uh, communicate with people about science when they've been thinking about something really, really, really specific for a long time and have completely lost tr um, track of kind of what normal people know, right? So this is why everything's kind of connected. Um, and uh, this notion of, of communicating to aliens, I mean, it rivals fiction, right? Uh, aliens haven't actually landed on Earth, but um, humans have, in reality, um, previously um, tried to communicate uh, with aliens. So this um, object here is known as the Golden Record. Um, uh, so the Golden Record was a plaque um, that they mounted uh, on the Voyager space probe. Um, people sometimes get this confused uh, with the uh, plaques that they put on the Pioneer uh, space probes. The plaques on the Pioneer space probes had um, two naked humans on them, a, a man and a woman. The, the Golden Record came three years after um, those ones. Um, and the reason why there's no naked humans on this one is because uh, a lot of people rang NASA and complained that we were sending nudes into space. Um, <laughs> I guess assuming that like aliens have the same kind of cultural hang-ups about our naked bodies as we do. Um, but, uh, so yeah, so when Carl Sagan came to design the Golden Record, like NASA literally wouldn't let him put naked humans on because of the kind of uh, public backlash that they got after the, um, after the pioneer ones. So the thing about these space probes is that we sent them all the way out to the very, very edges of our um, solar system, and, and they uh, were communicating with us the whole time and sending pictures back. Um, if anybody's seen the pale blue dot picture of Earth from, you know, uh, really far away, <laughs> that's uh, where that picture comes from. But all of these space probes have now left the solar system. They've gone beyond the solar system. We've lost communication with them. Um, we don't know where they are anymore. And the idea is that in about a thousand million years, and we'll all be dead, probably, um, aliens might come across one of these space probes um, and try and work out what these strange symbols mean, right? And be like, oh, um, you know, there, are, there is intelligent life out there. Um, we found evidence of it because these are clearly communicative images um, and sounds because it's also a record. Even though the, the, the golden record doesn't have nudes on it, um, one thing, there's two things that it does have on it that it shares with the pioneer plaque. So there's two things on this. Um, image that are also on the Pioneer um, plaques. Um, one of them is uh, this little guy in the uh, bottom right. Uh, sorry, I don't have a laser, otherwise I'd point to it, but these two little circle things. Um, and they represent the um, two states of, of hydrogen. And the reason why that's on there is because hydrogen is the most abundant chemical, um, el uh, the most abundant element in, in the universe, right? So it's likely that if there is intelligent life out there, 
um, they've probably worked out that hydrogen exists because there's so much of it all over the universe, right? So this is a really, really good thing to try and communicate because we know that it's shared knowledge between us and between the aliens, right? Um, so it's like just a kind of indicator to say, yeah, we're aware that this exists, um, so you know that we are also intelligent life forms trying to have this conversation with you. The other thing that is shared between both um, the, the, the Pioneer plaques and the Voyager golden record is um, the big spiky thing, which is on the, on the bottom left, and that is a pulsar map um, of where our solar system is in relationship to um, all of the different pulsar stars uh, that we've detected. Right? So it's basically a map to say where we are in the universe. Has anybody ever kind of downloaded an app on their phone and the app has asked, are you okay with sharing your location data with me? <laughs> and every now and then, at least I do, pause and think, I don't know if I am okay with you knowing my location data. But some guys, including Carl Sagan back in the 1970s, um, all sat down and made this decision on behalf of all of humanity that in thousands of millions of years, um, <laughs> some aliens are going to find this plaque. Um, and, and they're going to know exactly where we are in the universe. And they haven't ticked the consent box for that. <laughs> and I'm not sure I'm OK with that. There's nothing I can do about it now. Um, I'm not sure I'm OK with that, um, especially because like three years earlier, uh, we sent them our nudes. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so I think that um, this is a really, really nice example of why shared knowledge is so important when we don't have a shared language. Um, uh, and I also think it's an absolute successful bits of science communication that's happened in the past uh, few decades. It inspired a whole generation to re think really, really deeply about some of these topics. Uh, and so this is one of my favourite objects. Um, but yeah, that's why uh, aliens, language and science communication are all connected. Thank you. Thank you.